Muy buenos días con todos. Bienvenidos. Good morning and welcome to the second day commemorating World Food Safety Day. This is a webinar hosted by the FAO, Pan American Health Organization, ICA, and OERSA and CCLAC. We want to remind you that you can offer your comments and your questions on our YouTube page where we are broadcasting this webinar. We are now going to kick off the second day of our webinar with a video about livestock production. Roll the video. Honduras es el país líder de la región centroamericana en la producción y exportación de camarón de cultivo. Este rubro se destaca además con avances en they are standing out in traceability systems thanks to a strategic partnership with the public and private sector and international agencies. Since 2018, Honduras has had a national trackability or traceability system and an agriculture and livestock recording system, aiming to strengthen surveillance and implementation of phytosanitary programs and productive management, as well as planning and organization in the sector and visibility and access to markets. Illegal harvests. SINAC has a single mobilization form, which is a sanitary document that offers legality to moving shrimp around to trading shrimp and allows you to have phytosanitary oversight of these products and byproducts, whether they're agricultural or livestock, from the start to their final destination. There is also control over PCM mobility. We have these vehicles in the water, these beacons in five places throughout the water that make it possible to verify and record and have oversight of how shrimp is moving around in real time. There is a digital platform called Traza Agro, which lets you track every single movement and ensure traceability throughout the entire supply chain. And we've got 400 establishments enrolled and around 45,000 records of shrimp movements in the system. Las inspecciones que recibimos de Senasa es la primera autorización de que nosotros tenemos un cultivo que es viable, que cumple la inocuidad de un producto alimentario como los de Camarón. Luego tenemos también una serie de certificaciones que son las que nos sirven para accesar a algunos mercados internacionales, sobre todo europeos, que exigen determinadas certificaciones para poder entrar a esos mercados también. De esta manera nosotros garantizamos que el producto que aquí 
estamos eh, entregando es un producto que cumple con todas las medidas de seguridad, con todos los programas de, de inocuidad, cumpliendo también las normas ambientales reguladas por las autoridades ambientales también del país y todos los temas laborales, todos los temas eh, sociales que, que se requieren de manera que este producto llegue al consumidor de una manera completamente responsable. Perfecto. Vamos a iniciar. Esta... So we are now going to start our morning with our themed talks. We are welcoming on behalf of Nicaragua, Ángel Ortiz. Ángel, you are recognized. Thank you so much. I'm trying to share my screen. Can you see? No, not yet. Now we can see, so go ahead. Good morning. It's a pleasure to participate in this webinar focused on World Food Safety Day. I am Angel Ortiz, as you've heard. I am a veterinarian and I currently work as the safety director for carne sea, which is working in the meat industry or the beef industry in Nicaragua. So we are working for meat in Nicaragua to make sure we meet with the regulatory requirements for traceability and for safety. And our organization is there to ensure that we meet the technical standards and the regulatory standards in every area. 11026.10 N10 is one of the standards we have to meet for meat establishments, butchery establishments, and moving beef around or bovine meat. So this standard talks about a couple of definitions such as traceability, which is the ability to track the animal from the time it's uh, born to the time it's industrialized. We also have a CUE, which is a unique establishment code. It's a single code that the government assigns to every farm or every husbandry establishment. And it's a unique identifying code. We also have that unique identifying code for the animal, which is CUIA. And we've placed a device on every single animal in order to identify that animal and to have a unique code that allows us to identify that animal and to have the information that we need. We also have specific documents such as the GUMA, which is like a bill of lading for moving animals around. It's a document, it's a form that all the municipalities in our country uh, accept and the national police accept it as well. So when an animal or a livestock is purchased or sold, then a purchase letter is issued. And in that sales letter, there's I think we've got a technical problem. So we are going to wait a moment for our speaker to connect again. There seems to be a technical issue. In the meantime, let me remind you that if you have any questions, any comments, you are welcome to send them through our broadcast channel. There's a comments section there on YouTube where you can send us your comments and questions and we will be answering them at the end of all of the presentations today. We will be compiling all of the questions and our panel members will be available to answer those questions. El espacio para so que that comment section is open to our participants. 
please let us know what you're thinking on YouTube. We still seem to be facing a technical issue with our speaker. So on the side of production, I am going to ask if we should move to the next speaker or if we should try to wait for the speaker to reconnect. In the meantime, please let me know. Production, please let me know if we should move to the next speaker. I'm hearing from Ms. Catherine that she is available to start her presentation now. So I would just like to get confirmation from the organizers of the event to see if we should move to her presentation. So I have received confirmation. We are going to move on for now while we figure out the technical issue that we had with our last speaker, Angel Ortiz. So on behalf of Brazil, we have Catherine de Matos who will be joining us. The floor is yours. Please remember to turn on your microphone. Sigue sin estar activado el micrófono, Catherine. Catherine, we're still waiting for your microphone to turn on. Thank you. There you go. Go ahead. Buenos días. Me encanta el español, pero les pido permiso para hacer. I do love Spanish, but I'm going to ask for your permission to speak in Portuguese today. Yes, go ahead. Organizadores pelo convite para participar desse evento. É uma saudação especial à doutora Margarita Conrales, que sugeriu o tema. Bom, eu sou uma, uma profissional apaixonada por segurança de alimentos e, portanto, né, me sinto lisonjeada em participar hoje desse evento que marca a importância do, do tema. Então, aproveito também para cumprimentar todos os, os colegas palestrantes né, e, e todos aqueles que é, estão nos acompanhando. Bom, no primeiro dia do, do, do evento foi enfatizada a relevância da interação com o setor privado, portanto, é um prazer estar hoje aqui representando o, o setor privado para apresentar uma experiência do Brasil em rastreabilidade na cadeia de alimentos e bebidas. Para aqueles que não conhecem, a SIG Combiblock é uma empresa com presença global e uma participação uh, importante no mercado de alimentos e, e bebidas com oferta de sistemas de invase asséptico. E a SIG foi pioneira aqui no Brasil a trabalhar o conceito de, das embalagens conectadas, ou seja, é, soluções é, digitais nas quais a rastreabilidade ela é um grande e importante pilar. E é justamente nesse contexto que eu trabalho é, em parceria com a SIG para fomentar a rastreabilidade digital no setor de alimentos e bebidas é, aqui no Brasil. E hoje eu tenho a satisfação em apresentar para vocês um case uh, aqui no Brasil que usou a tecnologia a favor da rastreabilidade, ou seja, a tecnologia a favor da segurança é, dos alimentos. Nós podemos dizer... Uh, nós podemos dizer que nós estamos no meio de uma, de uma nova revolução dos alimentos, né? estamos vivenciando transformações muito impressionantes na cadeia de produção de alimentos, novas formas de produzir alimentos, carne cultivada, proteína vegetal parecendo proteína animal, robôs realizando atividades dentro das empresas, drones sendo utilizados no campo e com o avanço da, da tecnologia, o sistema de produção de alimentos, ele se tornará também mais é, digitalizado. E se nós já estávamos vivenciando mudanças é, tão impressionantes antes da pandemia, o fato é que o mundo é, mudou ainda mais nesses tempos de pandemia. A um, segurança de alimentos é, nunca foi tão importante quanto nesses tempos de crise, nesses tempos de, de pandemia. É, apesar de que né, não há evidência científica da transmissão do vírus pelos alimentos, o fato é que as pessoas passaram a incorporar hábitos de higiene, como lavar as mãos com mais frequência, passaram a se preocupar com questões de contaminação, adotaram hábitos como a higienização de embalagens, de, né, dos alimentos, frutas, as verduras, e essas são ações que tem um impacto muito significativo, positivo, na segurança dos alimentos. 
E, além disso, a pandemia também despertou a, a preocupação dos consumidores com a origem dos alimentos. Na verdade, é, conhecer a origem dos alimentos já era uma tendência sendo observada, no entanto, a pandemia acelerou esse movimento. E aqui eu trago uma pesquisa é, recente, publicada há poucos dias atrás, pela Inova Markets Insights, que indica que 85% dos consumidores consideram de extrema importância ter informações sobre os alimentos que consomem. Né? Então, e ainda nessa pesquisa, os consumidores disseram que também querem conhecer a origem dos seus ingredientes, das matérias-primas, querem entender as questões do processo, como o produto foi uh, fabricado. E os consumidores, pós-pandemia, continuarão valorizando as marcas né, que compartilham a origem dos produtos, que contam a história dos, dos seus produtos. E nós trabalhamos em uma cadeia uh, que tem uma característica global. Nós sabemos que o comércio uh, de alimentos ele é cada vez mais internacional. E essa internacionalização, ou essa cadeia de fornecimento cada vez mais internacional, ela aumenta a complexidade da gestão e da produção de alimentos. Né? E a gente sabe que a cadeia de alimentos ela não é aquela linha reta, né? aqueles desenhos esquemáticos que a gente costuma ver de representação da cadeia de alimentos, onde eu tenho um produtor que tem uma indústria, né? tem um caminhãozinho que vai para um supermercado. Né? Então, na verdade, não é... É, é, não é assim uh, que funciona a, a cadeia de alimentos. Né? A cadeia de alimentos ela é formada por muitos subsistemas. E quando ocorre um problema? Né? Quando ocorre um problema é, na cadeia de, de alimentos? É, diante de uma cadeia tão complexa como a cadeia de alimentos, muitos incidentes, é, infelizmente, envolvendo alimentos já ocorreram. E quando é necessário é, identificar um problema a indústria, muitas vezes, ela tem um desafio enorme na rastreabilidade dos seus, dos seus produtos. E a falta da, da, da rastreabilidade, ela proporciona impactos muito negativos para a sociedade e, obviamente, além de causar prejuízos econômicos. É, nós temos diversos relatos de problemas envolvendo alimentos no mundo uh, todo que causaram prejuízos uh, impactantes, é, e aqui no Brasil nós tivemos um, um exemplo né, de um, um caso recente que ocorreu é, com uma indústria que produz cervejas uh, com repercussões muito impactantes para a saúde dos consumidores. Foram 10 mortes é, e, e trazendo prejuízos aí enormes para a marca, perda de produto, fábrica parada, a perda da confiança do consumidor. E o Ministério da Agricultura do Brasil uh, investigou, né, foi o responsável pela investigação desse caso, e o relatório da investigação é, é, apontou falhas é, significativas no controle da produção e na rastreabilidade. Bom, esse é apenas um exemplo, né, é um caso, é, mas ele, esse exemplo, ele evidencia que é urgente que a falta da rastreabilidade ela seja tratada, afinal as consequências são muito sérias para a saúde pública. Portanto, diante da complexidade da cadeia de alimentos e das potenciais consequências em problemas envolvendo alimentos, muitos especialistas em segurança de alimentos, até mesmo antes da pandemia, atribuíam dois aspectos é, fundamentais para o sistema de proteção de alimentos, a rastreabilidade e a transparência. E como eu comentei anteriormente, a pandemia evidenciou é, ainda mais a importância desses dois aspectos. E diante da, da complexidade da cadeia, ou seja, são muitos fornecedores, muitas informações que precisam ser é, monitoradas, registradas, a rastreabilidade ela não pode mais ser baseada né, em papel, ela não traz a segurança nem a, a agilidade necessária. A rastreabilidade também requer a adoção é, da tecnologia. Inclusive, até no vídeo que a gente acabou de assistir, né, mostrou o, o exemplo de, de Honduras, uh, trazendo também a, a, a utilização da tecnologia para a rastreabilidade de camarões. Então, sem o uso da tecnologia, é praticamente impossível gerenciar uma cadeia tão complexa como é a cadeia de, de alimentos, que também requer a adoção de estratégias um, é, adequadas para possibilitar o seu gerenciamento. É, embora estejamos nesse evento discutindo uh, a experiência da nossa região, eu gostaria aqui de fazer uma rápida menção de um trabalho que os Estados Unidos está conduzindo na temática de rastreabilidade. O FDA lançou em 2019 uma, uma proposta de atualização na sua abordagem de segurança de alimentos, é, justamente impulsionada por todas as mudanças e as transformações que o setor está 
é, vivenciando. Então, vejam aqui uh, o, que um dos quatro pilares para o plano do FDA de uma segurança de alimentos mais uh, inteligente está baseada é, em tecnologias para rastreabilidade. Bom, e o Brasil? Afinal, eu vim aqui para falar da, da experiência brasileira. É, bem, o Brasil possui em sua legislação a obrigatoriedade da rastreabilidade na cadeia de alimentos há bastante tempo, tanto uh, pelo Ministério da, da Agricultura quanto pela Agência Nacional de Vigilância Sanitária. Inclusive, é, nós temos legislação desde 2005 que obriga as empresas a disporem de um plano de recolhimento de produtos. E para isso... Uh, é necessária que a rastreabilidade dos alimentos ela seja assegurada em todas as etapas da cadeia para garantir a efetividade de um recolhimento quando necessário. E eu quero aqui compartilhar uma recente e importante atualização uh, realizada pelo, pelo Ministério da Agricultura do Brasil, que incluiu um artigo é, na sua legislação, autorizando o uso de sistemas informatizados para o registro de dados pelas indústrias que são fiscalizadas pelo Ministério da Agricultura. E essa atualização, ela é muito positiva, pois muitas empresas, é, vamos dizer, elas tinham um receio sobre a adoção da, da tecnologia para o monitoramento e registro dos, dos dados de, de processo. O Ministério nunca proibiu a utilização da, da tecnologia, mas o fato é que a ausência de uma menção na legislação acabava gerando dúvidas nas empresas. Então agora, com um artigo explícito no, no Regulamento Técnico de Inspeção uh, Industrial e Sanitária, que nós uh, chamamos de, pela sigla é, RISPOA, o Ministério da Agricultura fomenta a adoção, da, é, indiretamente, né, é, fomenta a adoção da tecnologia. Então, as empresas acabam é, ficando mais tranquilas, sentem-se é, respaldadas pela legislação. E um ponto importante desse artigo refere-se às características do sistema informatizado. Ele deve possuir três pilares. Tem que ser seguro, obviamente, tem que ter integridade e disponibilidade das é, informações. Bom, no, no mundo nós temos vários exemplos de empresas que estão usando a tecnologia para rastreabilidade, inclusive com projetos uh, sendo impulsionados pelo varejo, como uh, Walmart e, e, e Carrefour. Um, acabamos de ver um exemplo também da, de Honduras e vamos ver mais exemplos. É, temos também é, Colômbia é, com... com já adotando tecnologias para rastreabilidade, e aqui no Brasil também temos um exemplo uh, inédito na cadeia de leite e que eu vou apresentar para vocês uh, com mais detalhes. É, portanto, as empresas que estão adotando tecnologia para rastreabilidade, elas estão apresentando resultados uh, impressionantes. Então, a rastreabilidade... Uh, que antes né, poderia levar semanas, dias, né, para é, identificar aonde está um determinado produto, agora ela passa para minutos, ou quem sabe até segundos, ou seja, com uma eficiência muito maior. E como eu comentei, então, no Brasil nós temos um, um projeto inédito com a implantação da rastreabilidade digital, na cadeia do leite. É, a, essa solução de rastreabilidade digital é, da SIG CombiBlock foi implementada, então, em uma cooperativa de leites que se chama Langiru, é, que está localizada no estado do Rio Grande do Sul, um estado no, no, no sul é, do, do Brasil. E eu quero apresentar o contexto desse projeto, né, de como nasceu a rastreabilidade é, digital. Então, esse projeto, ele nasceu em um contexto onde o setor de leites aqui no Brasil sofreu uma crise de credibilidade em função dos episódios de fraudes. Isso aconteceu em 2016, final de 2016, 2017, aqui no Brasil. E nesse momento, a Langiru, uh, que tem a qualidade, né, que tinha e que tem a qualidade como seu maior diferencial é, competitivo, ela precisou buscar uma solução justamente para mostrar para o seu consumidor que o seu leite ele era seguro e que mantinha a sua qualidade intacta. Então, foi aí que nasceu o projeto é, da rastreabilidade digital em parceria com, com a SIG. Um ponto bastante importante dessa tecnologia é que cada embalagem ela tem um QR Code único. A gente até olha a, as embalagens e acha que é tudo igual. 
mas no caso específico da Langiru, não é. Um QR Code é diferente do outro. E é justamente esse diferencial que permite que a empresa consiga saber exatamente onde está cada uma das suas embalagens, ou seja, em qual supermercado está cada uma das suas é, caixinhas de produto. E como funciona? Bom, então todas as informações do produto, nesse caso né, do leite, desde a fazenda, passando pela, pelas rotas, é, as informações da recepção do leite, do tratamento térmico, de todo o processo, da distribuição até o supermercado, elas estão centralizadas. Então, o leite é, é, da Langiru, ele permite, de fato, identificar as fazendas onde o, o produto foi coletado, mostrando, inclusive, a data, o tempo em que o leite foi envasado, desde a sua coleta. E aqui eu quero destacar também é, um ponto importante, que é que essa condição de, de conectar, né, de, de mostrar para o consumidor uh, quem é o produtor, que está é, produzindo aquele leite, fortalece o orgulho dos produtores e faz a conexão dos produtores com os consumidores é, da marca. Então, a indústria, é, com a implantação da rastreabilidade digital, ela tem em um único lugar todas as informações referentes às matérias-primas utilizadas, às embalagens e todas as condições do processo. E aí todas essas informações elas estão distribuídas nessas quatro grandes áreas, né? mapa de distribuição, insumos, dados de processo e ocorrência. Então aqui são todos os dados uh, é, da produção num único lugar, então como eu já mencionei, os dados dos insumos, enfim, as, o, o, as análises microbiológicas, fisico-químicas, ah, os tempos de produção, né, tempo e temperatura de tratamento térmico e por aí vai. Então, um conjunto bastante completo das informações num único, num único lugar. E justamente pelo diferencial de QR Code único por embalagem, a tecnologia ela permite identificar exatamente onde está aquela embalagem, em qual ponto de venda, em qual supermercado aquela embalagem está. Então, se for necessário o recolhimento de um determinado produto, a empresa saberá exatamente em qual mercado o seu produto está. E também, como todas as informações elas estão concentradas, é, a empresa ela pode analisar fácil e rapidamente a origem do problema. E, dependendo do caso, o problema ele pode não ter atingido todo o lote daquele produto. Então, se a empresa é, é, ela não vai precisar recolher todo o lote, ela vai recolher apenas aquela fração do produto que pode ser, pode estar potencialmente insegura. Então, isso traz uma agilidade muito maior. Então, mais rapidamente a empresa consegue recolher o produto é, do mercado. E do ponto de vista de saúde pública, a gente tem um benefício muito importante. Então, antes do projeto de, de rastreabilidade digital, a Langiru levava aproximadamente cinco horas para identificar um, um lote. Hoje eu costumo dizer né, que num clique a empresa sabe exatamente tudo de cada um das suas, das suas caixinhas. Outro ponto importante é, é a questão da segurança da informação e da confiabilidade dos dados, ou seja, a tecnologia ela permite que os dados sejam inviolados, ou seja, não é possível editar os registros. Então, uma vez lançado um dado no sistema, esse dado ele não pode ser apagado. Então, traz uma, uma confiabilidade, uma transparência também muito importante para é, os agentes é, de fiscalização. É, e as muitas informações do produto e do processo de fabricação também são disponibilizadas para o consumidor. Então, o consumidor, ao escanear o QR Code, ele consegue acompanhar muitas informações do produto. Então, vejam aqui é, alguns exemplos das informações que o consumidor consegue acompanhar. Então, desde as análises de qualidade do leite cru, as análises do produto pasteurizado, os dados do tratamento térmico e do produto final. Bom, é, esse já é o meu, meu último slide. É, o que eu é, acho que é super é, interessante é que a rastreabilidade digital, ela também é capaz de promover resultados tangíveis para as empresas. É, a Langiru, com a implantação desse projeto, ela ganhou market share e chegou à liderança em vendas no estado em que ela está localizada. E, além disso, houve uma melhoria na produtividade, então, impactando na redução de, de custos operacionais e aumentando uh, mais de 5% na produtividade. Ou seja, a rastreabilidade, além de aumentar a transparência, garantir a segurança de alimentos, garantir o cumprimento dos requisitos legais, né, permitindo uma rapidez no, 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 no rastreamento quando necessário, ela é capaz de efetivamente engajar os consumidores né, e promover resultados tangíveis para as empresas. 
E a apresentação, então, desse, desse case é uma demonstração real dos múltiplos benefícios, então, que a tecnologia proporciona para os diferentes atores da, da cadeia, então, começando lá pelo produtor, passando pela indústria, para o governo e também para o consumidor. Então, a rastreabilidade digital a favor, é a, né, a favor da, da segurança do, dos alimentos. Eu encerro aqui a minha a apresentação, agradecendo é, novamente pelo, pelo convite e eu fico à disposição. Perfeito, muitíssimas graças. Perfeito. Thank you, Catherine. I'd like to thank you for your presentation today. And uh, let's... Uh, is Ángel Ortiz uh, back in the session? Ángel, are you with us? Okay, he's uh, with us. So let me reintroduce him on Ángel uh, Ortiz on behalf of Nicaragua. Ángel, please. Apologize for the little technical glitch. As I said, I will be discussing the traceability system of uh, our uh, meat plant in Nicaragua in compliance uh, with the uh, mandatory uh, regulations in uh, Nicaragua 11.026.10, focused on uh, traceability, identification of animals in the plants, and the moving of uh, cattle. These regulation deals with traceability as such, which is making sure the traceability of the animal from uh, birth to slaughtering and processing. Uh, a, a single code, which is an ID number for each farm, the cuya, which is the animal identification unique uh, single code. Each animal has a tag, uh, this main, uh, a main and a secondary tag, uh, where we have the identification of the animal. Uh, there are important documents for the moving, uh, purchase and sale of uh, animals. And for that, uh, each municipality issues uh, a unique guide of animal movement and likewise a uh, sales uh, letter where all the inf animal information is uh, clearly specified so how do we uh, how do we implement uh, these uh, uh, regulations our company has a feedlot different points in our country we have a uh, uh, programmers, uh, they, they procure the animals and they make sure that the purchase follows the uh, traceability regulation. They review the uh, documents as uh, the uh, moving guides uh, and uh, using uh, based on the tax. These uh, animals are then taken to our facilities uh, for uh, growing. Uh, we have 140 uh, uh, stocks uh, for 12,000 heads and an annual production uh, of uh, slaughtering for 30,000 uh, stocks, uh, heads. When we receive the animals, uh, we have a IT system where we add all the information of the animal and uh, for each individual animal we buy. We enter the unique animal code and the sales uh, uh, letter associated to this animal. Likewise, there is a, um, there is a uh, first uh, veterinary drugs which are entered into the IT traceability system. There is a categorization by weight we do uh, 30 kilogram scale uh, intervals and with that we do the uh, classification or assignment to the uh, growing uh, pens. Our traceability system by weight will tell us what will be the period in the growing uh, process, 135 to 155 days on average in order to come to reach a 554 kilogram weight 
and that's our, 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 that's our live weight. And uh, 310 kilogram carcass. Additionally, uh, besides the, uh, the tag, as internal control, and as part of the internal traceability, we allocate an additional tag uh, to each animal, and this tag has a given color for each pen. And these, by potential uh, cases of uh, accidents, uh, accidentally change, uh, go, go to a different uh, pen. So uh, we're within this uh, growing uh, process, um, there is a second uh, cycle of uh, veterinary drugs, which are added uh, as in the beginning. So they are added to the internal traceability uh, system in our plant. Once the the whole uh, growth process is completed, the animal is, ta is ready to be taken to our uh, meat processing plant. There, the stock is, uh, we receive all the necessary information, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, that's the, uh, and our IT traceability system is added to us to learn all the uh, uh, historical data so as to make sure that, that the traceability is uh, kept uh, into the whole process. Once the animal is, uh, into, is in, the, in our plant, it uh, has a sequential order. This sequential order is uh, follow the next day for slaughtering and uh, once uh, slaughtered, this is identified using a, uh, a yellow uh, file. After the whole uh, slaughtering, veterinary inspection, uh, uh, cleaning, uh, washing of the carcass, this yellow uh, file with the number uh, allocated or signed uh, receives uh, an additional tag per each half carcass with a specific traceable information, and we can have information such as slaughtering date, uh, weight of the animal, the age, um, the batch, uh, the original batch, and the origin of the whole uh, batch. Those animals are kept for 24 hours in the cooling rooms, uh, and 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 after the purchase order is uh, is completed, which is uh, anatomical uh, cuts or bulk or portioned uh, cuts, whatever the customer requires, we identify the product with a, a label with all the traceable information. Finally, when um, a certain number of pieces are completed. The product is placed in a secondary packaging, a box, a crate. And, uh, and uh, again, this uh, box is uh, labeled. Uh, we have very important information, such as lottering date, uh, production date, uh, uh, preferred, uh, preferred uh, consumption, and our expiration date, and the batch. Batch is it's an important piece of information because it allows us to have all the information of these cuts uh, uh, upst uh, upstream. Once the product is packaged and uh, it's uh, sent to the storage and then uh, exported, our traceability system allows to know what market uh, this uh, product was sent, storage conditions of the product, the specific customer who received uh, the product, the number of batches, um, uh, the pounds of product, the pounds of products, and thus we can make sure full traceability of our product, since uh, if necessary, uh, actual withdrawal or, or, or product uh, 
calls uh, or recalls can be made faster and thus uh, guaranteeing reliable information for consumers or customers. There's a short video to tell you how it works at our meat plants when we are doing traceability and I am going to play the video. Pero si eso es una fiesta, Carolina. Imagínate la, can imagínate la cantidad de asados que hay ahí. <ríe> Be right back. Finalmente, el cumplimiento de este requisito legal. Compliance with these legal requirements has made it possible for us to reach markets all around the globe. We've been able to export to Central America, to the United States, and some countries in Europe and Asia. We've done all of this with the support and help of the sanitation and livestock and agriculture protection department in our country and this gives us the certainty to make sure that we can keep our consumers safe that's my presentation thank you so much fantastic thank you angel so to wrap up this first part we are going to welcome from the Caribbean, Desmond Ali. So Desmond, the floor is yours. Desmond, please turn on your microphone. Uh, let me put my presentation on. Can you see my presentation there? Uh, I've been invited to speak on traceability systems. I want to thank you for inviting me. Um, I am the executive director of the Caribbean Poultry Association, and I've been working for a number of years on traceability systems, not only in poultry, but also in the, generally in the food industry. The fact of the matter is that uh, traceability has become extremely important and has taken on a Desmond, new un segundito. Eh, es en el botón de color verde, por favor. ¿Cómo es? El, el colón, el... Eh, pues, you need to use the share screen button. It's a green button on the bottom of your screen. Can you see that? My slide? Uh, just a sec. I know. How is that? Is that better? Oh, shit. No, no vemos nada aún. No? Eh, We cannot see anything. Okay, Mientras Desmond, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So while Desmond, or while Desmond, go ahead if you can share your screen. Um, 
mientras Desmond puede arreglar su... So, while Desmond is figuring out how to share his screen, we do want to remind you again that you can ask your questions on our YouTube channel where we are broadcasting. Any questions or comments, please send on the YouTube channel where our team is compiling them, and we will pose those questions to our panel members at the end so you can share all your concerns. Desmond, now please go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you see my presentation now? Hello, can you see my presentation? No. No, no vemos nada aún, Desmond. No, we still cannot see anything, Desmond. De pronto, si producción puede... Perhaps somebody from our production side could send an internal message to Desmond to help him share the screen. O si nos pueden pasar la presentación para nosotros pasar. Maybe you could send us the presentation and we can show it on the screen. Okay. Can you see my presentation there now? No. No? No. Puede, por favor, Desmond, enviar por correo. Desmond, could you send your presentation by email to Sol? Sol can help us and put the presentation on the screen. Would you be able to send it by email to Sol? Can you see my presentation there now? Hello? I don't know. No. No? No. We cannot see the presentation. Oh dear, dear, dear. I don't know. Donde podemos. No avanzamos. Sorry about that. Is my presentation there now? Can you, uh, Pablo? No, no la vemos. No? We are unable to see it. I don't know what's going on with this thing. I'm sorry, I don't. I'm trying to share my screen there. Um, Bueno, nos indica que avance, avance sin la presentación. Por esta vez eh, tenemos algún problema técnico. So si for puede... now, uh, we're going to go ahead without the presentation. Perhaps you could just give your speech. You could just give your speech without the presentation. No, no, no la vemos. I... We cannot see it. Okay. I'm sorry about that, but I don't know what's going on. I'm having a problem here, actually. No, no podemos. No? No, no, no la podemos ver. I'm sorry about that. Mr. Desmond? Yes. Can you go ahead with your presentation without share screen? Don't worry about it. Oh, I'm concerned about that actually because I want any. I can go ahead, yeah. Okay, I wanted to say that the issue of traceability has taken on a new urgency because of the volume of uh, agri food trade has taken place after the signing of the WTO agreement in 1994. To give you an example, in 1990, this agri-food trade globally was about $400 billion. And in 1999, that uh, went up to $600 billion. And in 2018, 
the amount of food traded, agri-food traded globally is around about $1.5 trillion. So because of the fact that food supply chains have lengthened considerably, both in terms of time and geography, and the incorporation of a lot of new technology into the industry, there are now greater risks to the public health and consumer safety. Uh, there are several food management systems, that, as everybody knows. Uh, there's HACCP and there's ISO 22000. There are uh, uh, national and international regulations and standards. We all work with its standard operating procedures, training and documentation, collaboration, the number of rapid alert systems, and there's traceability. Traceability is defined by ISO 22005 and the Codex Alimentarius as the ability to follow the movements of a food or feed through the specified stages of production, processing, and distribution. And that's known as the farm to fork information management system. The components that make up a traceability are, first of all, the final product must have a unique identification code. Uh, you've got to disaggregate, disaggregate the process. You've got to document all elements in the supply chain, including labor and equipment, and many people forget to do that. And there has to be full data on each input element in the value chain. And every single process component, including labor, including all the equipment, including all the raw materials, must receive a unique code. There are two types of traceability systems, basically. There are paper trails, which are quite onerous and difficult to manage. And those are open standards. And then there's a whole range of paperless trails. Uh, there's spreadsheets, and I've been working on that for quite a while. That's an open standard. You can use uh, any spreadsheet for that matter. There's a the use of radio frequency ID, RFID. Uh, that's not an open standard, but that's uh, you have to pay for the RFID um, equipment. There are QR codes, which is an open standard. There's GS1. I will talk a little bit about that in a minute. And there's also blockchain, which has become a new, uh, new system, and it's an open standard as well. Talking a little bit about GS1, uh, what everybody knows is the universal product code. If you apply to GS1, they give you what is called a 13-digit GLN. That's a global locator number. And each company gets a unique number that's a six-digit prefix code and the manufacturer assigns, that's whoever gets that code, a five digit to the right of the six digits, and the 12th digit is called a check digit, and the tech check digit is a calculated number to ensure that everything is working well. I want to say that without coding protocols, traceability is onerous, time consuming, and even impossible. Every input in the supply chain must be coded, including all raw materials, labor, packaging, and equipment. And every single code must be unique. And finally, the final product must have its own unique identifier. Now, bear in mind that when, um, when firms are audited for HACCP, in terms of traceability, a requirement of the audit is that the auditor will choose a product and within two hours of giving that product, the 90% of the product must be fully traceable, otherwise you'll fail the HACCP audit. Uh, in terms of GSI, um, they have now expanded the 13-digit code, and they've got a series of codes that you can use. And there, there's a GSI data bar, which allows you 74 alphanumeric uh, digits in the code. There's GSI 128, which allows you 48 alphanumeric uh, digits in the code. And there's GSI data matrix, which allows you 2,335 alphanumeric, uh, alphanumeric digits in the code. So that you can end up with one of, using one of these systems. Bear in mind that if you use a GSI system, which is uh, pro provided by GSI and you've got to apply for that, you pay according to what you're using. When you apply for the six-digit code, you pay, I think it's $500 US, 
which gives you a unique global locator number for the company. And on top of that, if you want to use one of the other coding systems, especially the ones that you can use for traceability, which is GS128 or GSI data matrix, you've got to pay additional for that. Some people use QR codes, which are QR codes as their open standard. You can develop your own QR codes. The good thing about QR codes is allow you, it allows you 2,953 alphanumeric digits. So it's quite wide and it can serve a number of purposes. Remember that if you use QR codes or GSI data matrix, you've got to have an optical reader. The other codes that are, are, are uh, given by GSI are in fact barcodes and they can be printed on the label. Um, finally, before I close, I want to say that ultimately in traceability systems, it is virtually impossible to set up a traceability system without having proper coding protocols and coding must be logical Basically, I use a mathematical code, and every single code in the system must be unique. And the final product must have its own unique identifier, which allows you to do the trace box in the system. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry about the presentation. Uh, I'm going to send it to um, who I should, whoever I should send it to so that you can use it. Thank you. Thank you, Desmond. Eh, muchísimas gracias, sí, a todos nuestros espectadores. Thank you to all of our viewers. Sorry for the technical difficulties earlier. We are going to now see a video about the private sector. Let's roll the video. Carlos Domínguez, President of the Association of Meat Exporters in Chile. Carlos Domínguez, I'm the President of the Association of Meat Exporters in Chile. We are working in the food industry, especially in the pork and poultry industries. We are focused on exporting to meet the most demanding standards in the world, such as the United States, Japan, and the European Union, using best practices from each of these destination markets to export top quality protein not only in safety terms, but also in, in biosecurity. The poultry industry in Chile is working with unique codes and 100% of the companies that are exporting have control over the entire productive chain from the food plant to production, to the site, to logistics, to commercialization and marketing of the products. We do this in conjunction with a partnership between the public and private sector to guarantee 100% traceability across the system for a secure and safe product for our consumers in Chile and around the world. Safety is the responsibility of everybody across the entire chain. That is why we as an organization are working to strengthen traceability with oversight and training for everybody. We support training opportunities for all workers and employees, and we work with authorities from the health ministry to report and foster best practices in handling and preparation of food. That's how we are able to encompass the entire chain from suppliers to end consumers to make sure that they have healthy and safe products protecting everybody's health. Perfecto. Vamos a continuar Perfecto. ahora. Let's uh, go on to the presentation from Peru. Berta Muñoz. Berta, you are recognized. Welcome. Thank you, Jose. Greetings to all of you, and uh, thank you for your kind invitation to the Codex uh, Invitation for Latin America and the Caribbean from the General 
uh, food safety and uh, animal health and the National Codex Committee were pleased uh, to be part of this important meeting around a topic which is important for us all working in food safety the uh, World Food Safety Day I have a, a presentation to share with you basically on uh, a chain uh, approach we have in our uh, regulation but I would like to know if uh, you uh, ca can you see my slides uh, right uh, that's the presentation mode thank you well let me share with you some of the uh, experiences that we have had just an overall view of how we address food safety in our context especially for uh, the HESA which is uh, my organiza organization industrially produced uh, food overall some of the regulations uh, with this uh, chain uh, approach we have a uh, food safety uh, law different authorities uh, articulation uh, intersectoral uh, 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 spaces with the uh, issues that have to be addressed and uh, things that uh, have to be improved so as to continue to work uh, successfully one of the one of the strengths in food safety is that we have a, a unique uh, legal framework which involves uh, food safety law uh, vendors, uh, suppliers, consumers, and uh, authorities, relative, uh, relevant authorities. This chain approach, which is uh, all of us uh, in the food safety uh, are very familiar with uh, from the farm and the sea to the table, from primary production, considering uh, feed, which is uh, 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 the food for these animals, uh, processing, uh, industrialization, and marketing and, and distribution, considering imports or uh, exports, and last but not least, the uh, and, uh, consumer, which is uh, uh, the main beneficiary. Uh, this chain, which seems so simple, is more and more complex with uh, more and more issues and uh, this has to be supplemented with environmental issues with uh, this, uh, uh, these uh, issues that we all that, all, that all our countries are facing in our control systems so we have to update all these uh, concepts but the chain approach is uh, remains in our in our regulation Food safety in Peru is uh, throughout is distributed in three comp areas of competence: uh, agriculture, the Ministry of uh, uh, Agricultural and Irrigation uh, Ministry, and uh, which is competent on all the issues with the production and the primary processing of uh, f uh, food, including feed. Then, from the Ministry of Health, uh, uh, through um, we are competent for industrially processed uh, food, uh, food services, except for fishing and agriculture and production. The, the, the fishing uh, uh, health national agency, Sanipes, for agriculture and fishing. As part of these. Uh, food uh, chain uh, with a distributed uh, control system over distributed over uh, three uh, sectors one thing is going from the uh, farm from the table or from the sea to the table is easy to say but when uh, we want to go into the reality uh, that is uh, not that easy there are also levels of intervention uh, government uh, levels, as the authorities mentioned, uh, have uh, national competence, uh, but we also have uh, sanitary authorities at the regional 
uh, level, uh, health care, for instance, uh, and some uh, uh, Senasa and Sanipesca, which report to the National uh, Sanitary Authority in surveillance and then some uh, authorization, certifications, uh, uh, warnings, uh, issues of um, as executive issues, uh, rather. And let's not forget the local level authorities, municipalities that, uh, according to the uh, food safety law, they have roles in surveillance and sanitary control for food, which are sold uh, in the retail, for instance, markets, uh, self-service, restaurants, uh, among many other outlets. So the structure for, address the, 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 for addressing food safety is uh, it's, uh, complex, it's challenging. We don't have uh, one single agency. We, the uh, food safety law has uh, room for coordination to articulate the various activities uh, in, in food safety issues. There's a, the permanent uh, food, a multi-sectoral Committee on Food Safety, where we have the competent authorities at the national level, and that allows us to address uh, uh, competence issues in some gray areas uh, in, in, in primary processing or industrialization or other different topics that have to do with imports, exports. Uh, uh, from a foreign with foreign trade allies such, such as the Ministry of Foreign Trade and Tourism, and uh, the uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, those are articulated uh, management models which are being replicated at a regional uh, level. The regional governments uh, uh, have their own food safety regional committees where they join the efforts. Uh, uh, the, the idea is to have a, an, a comprehensive uh, view. Not we can not only work on primary production or or a, a given issues or topics in the in the chain, because all food will reach the tables, industrialized, fresh products, uh, imported products. Uh, so the view has to be comprehensive, and. Uh, uh, many of us, uh, many stakeholders are involved in this chain and in the area of, uh, of uh, control agencies, uh, we also have different sectors. Uh, for uh, regulatory uh, issues, uh, um, so the, the regulations on, on uh, 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 pesticide uh, wastes or or veterinary drugs, contaminants. Uh, and for food safety, that's a key role of public health care. The health care authority will do that, the Ministry of Health in our case, and um, surveillance, control, certification, inspection are distributed throughout the various authorities. So the regulatory technical issue it's very demanding in terms of uh, an ongoing uh, updating with an approach of this uh, food uh, chain, uh, uh, also having the uh, environmental dimension included in all the elements of uh, food safety. And we should also uh, mention uh, that uh, as part of the uh, as part of the scenarios that have to do with uh, competitiveness uh, and productivity policies in our country, we have the national productivity and competitiveness uh, plan. There are certain sanitary issues uh, which are uh, very well positioned in these scenarios. For instance, in the in the recently approved uh, competitiveness uh, policy. We have a unique sanitary inspector that's a, a, a control agency on behalf of the other sanitary agencies can carry out food safety inspections uh, in, in, in border. There has been pilot programs of unifying the profiles or, or, or uh, validating the sanitary inspection profiles 
it is true we have a high turnover I don't know the reality in other countries but in Peru we have a high turnover uh, frequent changes and therefore our profiles have to be uh, uh, have to be updated and, and trained this is an important area in uh, in the food chain issue uh, sanitary integrated sanitary alerts uh, or warnings and as well as traceability as mentioned uh, this morning we need uh, these uh, integrated sequence uh, in uh, control systems such as ours with a sectoral distribution uh, I would like to show you a part of the efforts uh, that are being made to integrate uh, in, the, in the sanitary documents and, and certificates for export and for the importing of uh, animal products for uh, processing for, for human uh, you know, human consumption and that have to meet safety requirements for, for public health and that and that so sanitary or, or, or animal health requirements we are working with uh, Senasa from agriculture in order to uh, 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 validate uh, certificates uh, with the uh, countries of destination and us authorities on, on, on both uh, sectors so as to facilitate uh, products to be exported uh, and, uh, and, and, ex and imported having a unique uh, certificate. This is a validation um, process we have to go through uh, with uh, destination countries and we have certain guidelines uh, for the articulation with the MinSetur which is uh, foreign uh, foreign trade and tourism ministry and the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Some uh, uh, products may uh, enter the country uh, with uh, in, in, in partial compliance with some of the requirements some uh, that are missing some certificates so we need to integrate uh, these uh, requirements this this uh, regulatory uh, requirements this is an example in the web page we have a certificate uh, with a note on uh, food safety uh, certified by Dijesa and uh, animal health or so sanitary by Senasa there are things to be done there are things to be improved of course technology key, uh, play, uh, puts uh, some certain challenges uh, the, the topics I, I have here that, that should be improved or updated that have to be uh, addressed are regulations uh, our regulatory framework have to be screened uh, through uh, risk approaches, health care. Um, we have to uh, clear certain administrative issues that uh, make no contribution. This has to be an ongoing process, an ongoing effort. All uh, uh, stakeholders um, have to work on this in order to improve uh, our regulations the unique uh, traceability system that, that through technology um, will have uh, traceable uh, f uh, food stocks so, uh, which are, which is good for many things but for food safety it's a critical the recognition uh, certifications of uh, general principles in in us as authorities we have to recognize uh, some uh, or, or, or validate certain certifications warehouses for instance that may uh, or logistic services for all for us it, it is also important uh, uh, to support a uh, production chains uh, with the uh, small producers and uh, micro and small food uh, businesses we have a good size of a good, a good amount of uh, food stocks are produced by small companies where 
sanitary issues are difficult to implement. Therefore, we need the, the, this support in this uh, small productive chains at primary level, as well as uh, bigger industries. So I believe this is important to have uh, these uh, support strategies in place. We're doing this, um, I, but uh, we have to understand that these uh, uh, general topics need, uh, uh, need to be addressed. Uh, uh, consumers are also important, uh, communica risk of communication also. This has to be standardized, uh, has to be integrated. Uh, uh, c consumers receive uh, 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 food uh, covered by all three uh, agencies. Uh, so we need uh, risk communication to the population also. And of course, in this presentation, there is a uh, uh, topic uh, in, in these uh, pandemic uh, times, uh, and of course, uh, maybe after the pandemic, this is uh, the emergence uh, of the so-called ollas comunes, as we call them. This is a collective uh, food preparation, uh, a lack of jobs, uh, and therefore a population is managing this uh, collective uh, food preparation. We're, we, we have to be, we have to acknowledge this situation and from the sanitary and healthcare uh, 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 agencies, we have to offer certain guidelines uh, to uh, prepare these uh, food uh, collectively. The Ministry of Health has a uh, document that has been prepared, which is being used by the NGOs or, uh, or religious organizations, uh, church organizations addressing or, or, or managing these uh, uh, collective uh, food preparation. This, uh, we have to see that uh, we have to we have to recover uh, a, a, a food uh, uh, in uh, especially in in, in the farmers uh, market where NGOs are collecting are re retrieving and, and uh, food from these uh, places this is something that is part of the reality part of our real of our reality and uh, as authorities, as food authorities, uh, we have to bear this in mind. Only a couple of numbers on the food safety uh, uh, task group uh, in Lima, in the metropolitan Lima, this is partial, this is partial numbers. We have uh, uh, 233,000 beneficiaries that eat uh, from these, uh, uh, these collective preparation uh, of, of food, uh, and 23% uh, uh, are, uh, are younger than five years of age. This is, this is an element that has to be addressed as a sanitary uh, authorities, as uh, healthcare authorities. So, so that's, that's my presentation. I would like to thank you again for the opportunity to share this with you. The, those are the emails. Uh, Dijesa Consul and Ministry of Health and Normalim, which is uh, my uh, email, uh, of course, uh, for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Berta. And uh, yes, we will now into the presentation of Trinidad and Tobago. So, Alisa, the floor is yours. Hi, good, good afternoon, everyone, or oh, good morning, depending on where you are. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen.
not sure why it's not coming up. Um, just give me one moment again. Can can you confirm you are seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Okay, can you confirm that you're seeing the first slide? Jose, can you see my slide? No. No. Finish. Can you see my slide now? Yes. Ah, thank God. <laughs> okay, so. Um, so my name is Lisa Indar. I'm the Director of Surveillance Disease Prevention and Control at CAFA, which is the Caribbean Public Health Agency. Um, we serve 26 member countries and we work very closely with PAHO when it comes to food safety. In fact, before we were CAFA, one of our, we were uh, CAREC, and um, we worked, um, which was uh, PAHO WHO, uh, one of the PAHO WHO agencies. We are now separate, but we work very closely together when it comes to food safety. So we do have um, many different work that we do in food safety. And I would give an update and all towards the trend of safe food now for a healthy tomorrow. You know, I want to start by saying, you know, if we need to have safe food, we need to have food safety. Um, and not just food safety, but we need food security. Because safe food is a function of many things. It's having that food that is available and affordable and also safe to eat. So healthy, safe, affordable, and available food. So at CAFA, when we think about improving food safety, we know we have to take a multi-pronged approach. And the first is to you know, reduce our foodborne illnesses. Um, and we do that through um, foodborne disease surveillance. And we have, uh, you know, many, uh, we have a foodborne disease um, focal area and we have a unit um, that does surveillance and all towards improving, reducing foodborne diseases. If foodborne diseases are reduced, we know we will enhance food safety, food security, and give you a healthier, safer product. And this will give you safe food. This will contribute to healthy lives as well as tourism um, and economic sustainability. So what is this impact of foodborne disease on food safety? Well, I'm sure you have seen this data, but you know, foodborne disease pose a very, is a serious public health issue and it poses quite an impact on food safety and food security. So recent data from the CDC showed that every year you know, um, one in 10 persons may become ill, causing 33 million healthy lives years lost, um, 420,000 deaths, and most of it are, are among children. But the issue is, you know, this is preventable. It's common, but preventable. And as we know, only a fraction is reported. We also, at CAFA, um, and previously CAREC, conducted 
a Caribbean burden of foodborne diseases in um, 10 countries. And what we found was that this burden of foodborne disease and the economic impact of foodborne disease is much, much more than what was actually reported. And we found that every year, one in 49 persons were likely to get a foodborne illness. And most of them were children. And it was quite a high cost. It was costing countries $21 million per year. And that's quite high when you consider the Caribbean economies. What we found too, that there was a lot of underreporting and a lot of underdiagnosis. So, you know, when they say a fraction is reported, in our case, it's probably less than 10% is reported. And um, because of countries vary in capacity, you know, not everything was diagnosed. From that study, we found norovirus, salmonella, campylobacter, and the parasite giardia was the most common. Then we also found we are dealing with 26 countries of different practices. So the etiology was different from that reported and also different in different countries. In our burden of illness studies where we found one in 49 persons, we also found that when we had mass gatherings, that number was one in 11. So mass gatherings, like, you know, those popular events like sports and carnival and other things, you know, Christmas gatherings and all those um, things that are allowed for, 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 for persons to come in close contact, it meant one in 11 persons were more likely to get ill. We know too that foodborne diseases has no boundaries and there's this increased risk of you know foodborne disease spread due to globalization and travel and trade and regional integration and so on all these are particularly important to the caribbean because the caribbean countries are very small our borders are very very porous and it's very easy you can actually leave your country today and go to two or three different countries in one day so while you're moving, you can carry about foodborne diseases. The other thing about the Caribbean too, is that you know, it imports most of its food. So our food supply and our safety and the integrity of our food depends on that whole process of you know, safe and healthy and wholesome um, importation. I spoke that we do have varying laboratory capacity. There are some countries that can identify three or four pathogens. Some cannot. Many, many countries use CAFA as their diagnostic labs. And we all know there, there are about 200 types of foodborne illness. Um, we have been training countries. Um, we have managed to train you know, about 13 countries to at least test for the seven or eight most common types. There's also varying surveillance capacity. The other thing is that we have very outdated food safety policies. Some, you know, are, are as old as 20 and 30 years old. And with that, there is, no la there is no enforcement on legislation. So how do you really ensure food safety? Also, we are the most tourism dependent region in the world. So we, we are small, but you know, tourism can, contributes depending you know between 40 to even 60 percent of our um, our economic uh, gross national product so that means that illnesses you know new illnesses like whether it be bacterial viral or parasitic can come through travel and trade and we saw this we saw this for norovirus we saw it for non-foodborne illness like like um, COVID-19 and so uh, we also saw that we have had reputational damage in tourism-based establishment and accommodations or cruise ships when you have foodborne outbreaks. Data also shows that traveler's diarrhea is the most common illness for travelers coming to the Caribbean. So improving food safety, reducing foodborne disease is not just important for safe food, but it's important for the safety and security of our visitors that are coming in and for sustainable tourism. And this whole issue of food safety and foodborne disease surveillance is a significant threat to national and regional health security. Further again, the Caribbean population is now aging 
And as we know, older persons are at increased risk. Persons also under five years are at a risk of developing uh, AG, which causes you know, more uh, severe symptoms. Uh, street food vending too is quite popular um, in the region. Um, and it's also something that travelers are, are drawn towards. This has you know, the potential of different food handling practices and could perhaps be, you know, lead to increased risk of, con of contamination. Um, when you take all of this Caribbean context, we are small and we have varying capacities and um, situations. Um, and then you add to the fact our geographical location. We are predisposed to hurricanes and storms and flooding, which all contribute to foodborne disease, because when you have hurricanes and storms and flooding, it means that you, know, you have more food and waterborne illness and therefore more food insecurity and increased risk of um, ca contracting illnesses, especially you know, like hepatitis C. And of course, when you add climatic change to this, it is changing the etiology of some, of some bacteria. So that's the context of the Caribbean. What CAFA, and I want to say before CAREC, and which we continue to do with PAHU, is that we are implementing an integrated approach to foodborne disease surveillance and food safety. And why are we doing that? Most foodborne disease are zoonosis. It means it comes from the farm. So if we really want to, to you know, to um, make a difference, we have to get to the source. You know, whether it's a chicken farm or, or the vegetable farm or the fish farm, we have to get to the source. So we need to link the pathogens to the source. It means the epidemiologists must be working with the laboratories and the veterinarians and the environmental health officers. So that's the approach. It means that countries have multi-sectoral teams and it means countries need to share their data of linking human, animal and food data. And this is the same thing as the One Health approach. So we, the, some of the key activities we have been doing at CAFA and working with our 26 countries are, when it comes to foodborne disease, we look at syndromic surveillance, um, more for the trend of acute gastroenteritis. Um, we, we, we continue to, to promote multi-sectoral surveillance, that is the One Health or the integrated approach. We, from, we, we support laboratory surveillance, environmental surveillance, and evidence-based surveillance. We have many programs at CAFA, and you know, it cross-cuts food safety and foodborne disease cross-cuts. So first, you know, the lead area is the foodborne disease or the tourist, and the tourism and health program. But of course, it, cro it cross-cuts with the health information and communicable disease, vector-borne disease, and environmental health uh, surveillance department. So we work closer and we work, to, and we work closely together in terms of integrating our approach. Moving on to syndromic surveillance. How, what do we do? We collect information from local population as well as travelers. So our countries will report on a weekly basis um, local infections and we would look at those syndromes. And for foodborne disease, we would look at the acute gastroenteritis. We will compare to past threshold. And if we see a flag or something has passed a past threshold for a week in a particular country, it could be a likelihood of an increase or an outbreak and we work with that country to send samples or to find out what is happening. For travelers diarrhea, we have a unique system, a uh, uh, web-based uh, tourism and health information system. So this is real time. And what it allows, it allows a person who is sick to report or it allows a hotel to report um, or airplay, an airline to report, you know, once you have illness. And that does the same thing in terms of trends. And it alerts you if you have passed a threshold for gastroenteritis. So with the syndromic surveillance, it's really our early warning system. So from the traveler's health as well as local syndromic surveillance, the aim is to pick up something very quickly so that we can be able to work with countries to reduce spread as much as possible. And um, if there are outbreaks that we can mitigate that as soon as possible. 
With respect to the lab, um, we strengthen laboratory capacity and we also have a medical microbiology lab. And we also do food testing at our environmental health and surveillance um, department. So CAFA supports countries through identification, typing, um, serotyping, pulse field, PCR, ELISA typing. And the idea is to, to be able to do the higher level while we train countries to be able to identify the, the major pathogens. Uh, most of the clinical samples would come to, to our Port of Spain campus in Trinidad and the food samples would go to our campus in St. Lucia. And then, you know, all the typing will be done in Trinidad. We also do training by our um, Cari Flynn network for surveillance standards and laboratory capacity. And we do a lot of training in labor integrated laboratory surveillance. So, you know, uh, the other thing our lab is now moving towards is genome sequencing. Um, and we hope that this process comes so that we can offer this new service. In terms of foodborne surveillance and regional trends, this is, this is near and dear to our heart. As I said, we started integrated surveillance. We have been training in integrated surveillance and we did the burden of illness study as well. The capacity building is done through our foodborne departments, our FELTEP uh, departments that talks about field and um, laboratory epidemiological training. Countries, over 13 countries have been trained in integrated surveillance, outbreak, risk assessments. Um, we have worked with PAHO to carry on um, different types of, of training for the, using the WHO model for foodborne disease in, um, investigation, and as well as, um, you know, strengthening their, their, their training them at different stages of foodborne surveillance, whether they, whether they are in stage one, two, or three. We also uh, work in countries to integrate and co coordinate a multi-sectoral foodborne surveillance approach to, and to integrate that with antimicrobial surveillance because um, as we know, you know, AMR is a big part of foodborne disease surveillance. So what has happened? Many countries, 14 countries, have been trained in integrated surveillance, improved laboratory diagnostics. Um, we have enhanced our laboratory capacity at our regional lab. We are seeing more enhanced timely outbreak investigations. We have conducted the burden of illness studies, and we are really promoting that intersectoral co collaboration and partnerships. What is the data telling us? Well, the data tell us, tells us first, if you look at this graph, that in terms of outbreaks, foodborne disease still are the most common outbreaks when you compare that to respiratory and vector-borne and so on. Albeit, you know, we can't use the COVID-19 pandemic data, but when we look at overall data, we will see that foodborne is the first com uh, when compared to the other types of diseases. And these are the common pathogens that are causing illness. Salmonella, Cigatera, Shigella, Campylobacter, Pathogenic E. coli, Listeria, Vibrio, Hepatitis, Rotavirus, and Norovirus. And what we see too is a different predominance of different pathogens in different countries or in different practices uh, or, or, or by their different practices. The other things we are seeing is in the last, in the last five years, we are seeing more cases of uh, viral pathogens like norovirus, and um, we also see an increase in Campylobacter, and we are seeing a decrease in terms of Typhi, which is perhaps due to more improved public health practices and Shigella. When we look at our outbreak, uh, outbreak data, uh, Cigatera or fish poisoning is still very common and salmonella and norovirus are some huge causes of outbreaks. And of course, the situation with cigatera as a food poisoning agent, you know, um, cooking is not going to destroy this toxin. So we are working with countries, there are countries that actually know, you know, 
um, the situation where, 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 where it's risky because it all depends, you know, on seasonality and when, when the fish eat the algae at a certain time. So we work with countries to develop, you know, practices to ensure that uh, certain fish are not harvested during certain times of the year. And, you know, the fish that are more um, likely to be at risk, like, you know, the larger fish, uh, the tuna and the mackerel and so on are not harvested during certain times. We do serotyping at CAFO and this is very This is very This is very instructive for, for our prevention and our most common serotype are enteritidis and typhi miriam. What that tells us, you know, enteritidis is linked to eggs and chickens and typhi miriam to the meats so it tells us what we need to do for prevention. And when we compare this by country, it really helps in country intervention. So if you look here, you know, Barbados, Typhoon Miriam is very common. But look at Bermuda. Mississippi here is most, is most uh, common. And that's related to a practice, you know, of birds, um, certain types of bird pooping on the roof. So we know that tells us what are the public health practices to do when we do these serotyping. The other thing we are doing, we have just um, started the process and we hope to implement very soon, is to have that integrated multi-sectoral national assessment. So the entire CAFA um, is working on a communicable disease surveillance assessment and foodborne disease and food safety is one part of that assessment for in, uh, where we would assess countries on their integrated surveillance practices. Um, CAFAs, it's our health information unit, our environmental unit, our laboratory and our foodborne disease, uh, TH and tourism and health. Um, departments work towards integrated outbreak investigations and looking at trends and developing, um, putting all of this in our quarterly surveillance reports. So every quarter, besides those weekly reports, we, we send out um, uh, integrated quarterly su uh, surveillance report. The other area we focus on, because we are so tourism dependent and because we know food safety is important for tourism, is that we, we address, you know, our foodborne disease uh, departments and our tourism and health departments are really one department. And we've, we have developed specific tools for improving food safety through our tourism and health program. And that is surveillance of, um, you know, traveler's health, which we just spoke about, a lot of training and guidelines and standards of operation. So when it comes to surveillance, I spoke about, um, you know, we have a real-time information system to look at traveler's health, and we do see cases of gastro reported. Uh, when it comes to, to surveillance, to the way how this particular surveillance is built, that if a threshold is passed, it gives you an alert. So this allows you, this allows a hotel, or it allows a tourism facility to be able to do something very quickly. The threshold is greater than 2% staff and guests. So once that is passed, that is, that is looked up as an outbreak. We do a lot of training for, for the tourism sector, and that's important because if, you, know, you don't want the tourists to get sick. So we have the advanced food safety training and certification. That's a certified training that's recognized worldwide. We do training you know, on surveillance and response to traveler's illness, prevention of foodborne disease. Um, and you know, we will roll out things like water quality and environmental management. We have done training on how to prevent norovirus, uh, workers' health. So it's a whole um, set of multi-sectoral training aimed at improving food safety. We're also developing standards for the hospitality industry, one of which is food safety standards. And um, that would become a regional standard, you know, hopefully before the end of the year or early next year. When it comes to COVID, um, we do know that there is no evidence that COVID is spread by food or water. However, 
we, we have to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, COVID is spread by direct contact with droplets from, produced by sneezing. And so therefore it could be passed, you know, between a customer and a food service staff by the improper practices like, you know, sneezing and not wearing a mask or touching a surface and so on. So what is important and what, what we do training about on is to ensure that, you know, that all the COVID-19 practices are now embedded in food, in food service, meaning, you know, from the time from, from, from purchasing down to service, that in addition to all the food safety practices, you know, of wearing your, your hair nets and, and personal hygiene and so on, you also have to wear your mask including in the kitchen, and you have to, to stay six feet apart. So your kitchens cannot be, you know, fully, fully um, uh, with the full um, amount of persons. It's about half the amount of staff. And it's important, you know, that you social distance and you wear your mask and that you wash your hands properly, that you wear PPEs, that you cook all foods um, thoroughly. You do not serve raw and cooked food and you wash your fruits and vegetables. So everything from food preparation to service, you must now include your COVID-19 public health measures of mask and social distancing and hand hygiene. And we do a lot of training. In fact, we have trained, you know, almost 7,000 persons, well, 6,000 plus persons um, on the tourism sector on COVID-19. And we include, you know, ensuring food safety as well how to wash your hands, you know, how to clean and sanitize, what are the food safety preparation activities to ensure you're not, uh, you know, not through your practices, you're encouraging food safety spread. Okay, so we do prevention and control. This is some of the infographics we do put out, you know, and we have a lot of videos that talks about preventing and controlling um, COVID-19. So. Again, this is some here, um, and the idea is to work and to distribute this information as much to countries so that we can improve food safety. Moving on to climatic change and foodborne surveillance. What is the potential effects of climate change on foodborne disease? Well, the increase in sea surface temperature um, secondary to global warming obviously can change the, the whole etiology and ecology for, for, for some species like Vibrio parahemolyticus um, with sea surface. Lisa, excuse me, the time is yes. ending, please. Okay, thank you. And so this allows for that increased risk of contamination and um, foodborne outbreaks. We are collaborating with PAHO to ensure, you know, through the EU Climate Change Grant to highlight the emerging effects of climate change on foodborne disease and to develop health promotional materials for environmental health officers as well as ministry. Coming down to my end, um, on our environmental side, you know, we are, we are looking at environmental surveillance and environmental pr preservation, uh, wash standard testing of environmental samples. And of, we are working too with our food nutrition and food security, food nutrition department to ensure, to promote food security and reduce insecurity. Um, as you know that the whole impact of the pandemic has increased food insecurity. And we continue doing that with the One Health approach. Finally, we would work and we continue to, to, to look at the researchers out there to, provide, to, pre, to continuously present evidence-based reports. What are our gaps? Laboratory capacity, coordination, insufficient, um, communication and coordination, human resources, technical staff, and of course, we need to move from putting these in draft guidelines to, to finalizing them. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you, Lisa. Vamos a continuar. Thank Ahora. you, Lisa. We shall continue now with uh, Daniel Munstad uh, de Oca. He's in the Dominican Republic, Daniel Montes de Oca. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. After Lisa's uh, presentation, which was uh, quite long, um, 
we will now uh, present uh, on uh, handling of uh, food and uh, 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 FD, uh, FBDs. There will be some uh, points uh, that will not be addressed because of the time. We only have 15 minutes. My name is uh, Daniel Montes de Oca, and uh, my topic is handling of uh, food and FBDs. So we have to begin with some concepts to better understand the handling of uh, food and the, uh, and the FBDs. And of course, uh, uh, a handler it's someone who oh, ha uh, is packaging the food in contact with you, 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 items in contact with the direct contact with the food uh, these con this person has to meet certain uh, hygiene uh, uh, requirements to allow uh, or, or to prevent uh, contamination of food during the handling but there are certain high-risk uh, individuals, uh, those uh, high-risk uh, uh, handlers or have direct contact with their food, uh, as well as people that have intervention in the preparation of the food. And also low-risk uh, handlers, uh, both high-risk and, and, and high-risk uh, handlers need to be trained on, on these topics. Uh, training on the hygiene and, 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 and the FBDs uh, from packaging, from hands, uh, fr from, the, from himself or herself uh, to the uh, food. Uh, low risk, uh, keep contact with the food that will go through a, a, a subsequent preparation process. So as the definition says, they will have a lower likelihood of contaminating the food because this food will have a subsequent process that may eliminate uh, contamination uh, occur during the handling process. And uh, food hygiene, according to uh, WHO, food hygiene are all the necessary measures to guarantee uh, health care safety of uh, food. The Codex Alimentarius says that uh, for uh, uh, do we need to have the right conditions for the preparation, production, uh, storage, and distribution of food in order to have a safe uh, product? And uh, food contamination, of course, is the presence of a foreign agent or, 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 or any other object that, can, that, that may cause a disease in, in an individual when ingested. Now, what are the the relevant factors that uh, uh, have an impact on the handling of food. Well, there are three. Well, there are many, actually. But the fundamental actors are the hygiene of individuals, of uh, the hygiene, uh, hygiene habits, and the hygiene of the, of the environment in the handling of, uh, of food. Food will be manipulated throughout the whole chain, production, preparation, and consumption, therefore, uh, extreme careful must be exerted when handling uh, food in each, step, in each step. For primary production, or, or the fuel production, uh, food handlers will have to have uh, a procedure of uh, hygiene to avoid uh, contamination when harvesting, because that's uh, when uh, that's uh, the, 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 where everything starts, and that's where a contamination may take place. And even though there is a subsequent process, it is possible that if there is a uh, chemical contamination, uh, these might not be eliminated in subsequent processes, even though uh, if we have a microbiological contamination, this might be eliminated in the subsequent process, but uh, I'll be very careful in, 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 
in handling the the food uh, in the first uh, uh, step. Second step is is the industry, uh, the preparation, which is used as uh, as a raw material for for other for other food, namely uh, fruits or vegetables. In this uh, in this uh, step, or, or we uh, are careful. We have to be careful when handling the food, the necessary hygiene when handling the food, because here again there might be a, a contamination, and uh, uh, these may uh, lead to problems uh, upon consumption in supermarkets, uh, grocery stores, uh, or, or 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 farmer uh, farmer markets. It's that's an important link, an important step, or. Because we have more uh, greater handling because if you go to a grocery store or a supermarket and you grab a, uh, a, a, an apple um, a, you will put it back on the shelf but you you probably have transfer uh, any contaminant uh, taken from the street uh, into the uh, supermarket shelf so uh, this is really important but also the last uh, link uh, of the chain, the, the last stage, is consumption. Restaurants, uh, uh, or, or at home, uh, or, or any other place, any other place out in the street uh, where we eat the food. Uh, here again, if everyone else uh, were not careful enough in handling the, the food with hygiene, then us may and for receive the, the, the contaminants uh, and ingest the contaminants and cause FBDs. So this, this is an extremely important link or stage and uh, this is critical. And, and uh, the, uh, uh, the washing of hands and, and, and hygienic uh, or hygienizing uh, practices are important. That what are the type of uh, types of food and how these are contaminated for preservation, for perishable, for instance, uh, they demand a special preservation uh, in in storage and transportation requirements that may be subject to uh, poor handling uh, and therefore uh, leading to contamination. Uh, Semi-perishable. Uh, food which have been preserved and processed using different uh, processes that will extend uh, shelf life in the proper conditions but they may be contaminated and uh, therefore lead to an uh, FBD and uh, non-perishable food that that uh, require uh, no special con uh, preservation conditions for uh, legumes or cereals or dry fruits but Poor handling, uh, poor hygiene uh, may uh, tra transmit uh, contaminants and lead to FBTs. We also have that because of uh, alterations in or tampered, uh, uh, we can have tampered, uh, uh, or just altered uh, food that because of natural, physical, chemical, and biological uh, or inadequate treatments has suffered a deterioration in the organoleptic uh, uh, characteristic which make it inadequate for human consumption uh, damage of food uh, which is uh, aging a uh, change in the color uh, the, this uh, not necessarily uh, will lead to an FBD but it uh, it's a sign it's a sign that that there may be some contamination and contaminated food is the one that uh, has uh, pathogens or chemi chemicals uh, or, or radioactive s or, or substances toxins uh, or, or any other uh, substance that may that may change that may alter or that contaminates the whole food as such and will lead to an f D. We also uh, have the various types of uh, contamination, biological contamination that is uh, uh, present uh, throughout the whole chain we just mentioned. And the uh, farm, that's where production begins, 
that's the first uh, step we may contaminate products with uh, feces animal feces um, uh, we use that manure that is used for agricultural production or or feces from uh, other animals that, uh, that, uh, that may contaminate products, or uh, rats uh, that may contaminate products, as well as the feces of, uh, uh, of any other type of, uh, or, or any other chemical substance that may come uh, from uh, industrial areas, uh, say. Um, uh, any s chemical, biological substance that may uh, reach from the water, from the air, from the soil that may contaminate uh, the food. Also, a biological contamination uh, occurs not only in the primary production phase out, out, in, the, out in the field, but, uh, but also in the, in the outlets uh, and storage uh, uh, centers. Uh, or packaging uh, centers and therefore it's really necessary to keep uh, good hygiene in the handling of products because we, we might have uh, transmitting microbiological contaminants that uh, will lead to an FBT. We can also have natural hazards but this is not the result of a poor handling of, um, of, uh, the, of, the, of the individual. This might be natural contaminants in, in the in the in the uh, food, uh, uh, the uh, fungi, for instance, uh, toxins. Uh, if there is a, a good handling, you might eliminate certain toxins. Therefore, in the contamination here it will be the food uh, rather than the as a result of the handler. And this chemical contamination that uh, it's uh, also from the uh, country and then the field and the farm and uh, throughout the chain will have uh, uh, agro uh, environmental agrotoxics uh, uh, such as uh, uh, pesticides, uh, uh, some uh, fertilizers or, and uh, uh, migration of, uh, of uh, elements from different packages also. Uh, uh, persistent organic compounds uh, such as uh, heavy metals such as cadmium, lead, mercury, arsenic that may contaminate the food as such. There's, this uh, could be anthropogenic but uh, could also be taken by the man. Una contaminación directa al alimento o indirecta al alimento, y como tal vas a producir una ETA. En el caso de las interacciones de los envases, eh, evidentemente es conocido por todos que envases que, puede, eh, que son permeables, que pueden penetrar eh, microorganismos o cualquier sustancia química eh, o cualquier olor o sabor, eh, evidentemente vas a llevar esa sustancia al producto y como tal, entonces va a haber una contaminación directa desde el envase hacia el alimento. Y we could have a substance entering through packaging as well. Then we have pest contamination is another option. We have the entire food chain where manipulation, handling of food is happening. And we have major sources of contamination that are utensils and stores. And we have to be very aware of what we're doing, what the contaminants are, what could be there in a store, what the equipment that is being used is that could come into contact with food. You need good hygiene for your staff. You have to be in direct contact with the food, so we need to be very aware of the techniques being used to prevent a foodborne illness from that direct contact. Improper hygiene in places that sell food is a major focus of food contamination. So that type of contamination, as you can see, uh, it's very visible. You can see this type of contamination happening in the food and it is a major source of food contamination. 
and it can also lead to foodborne illness. Another source, Danielle, I have to ask you to wrap it up. I've got five minutes, 10 minutes, how long? Two minutes, two minutes left. Okay, so I'm going to get straight to the point. We're going to talk about the foodborne illnesses directly because I think I've used up way too much time. Evidently, all poor handling of food in stores, in storage centers, in farms is going to lead to the consequence that you can contaminate the food and therefore you could have a foodborne illness. So this is the slide that we also saw from Lisa earlier. I am not going to go into the stats right now because of time restrictions, but I do wanna to get to this slide. This is about the types of contamination that we can find. And we heard this already, but I do want to emphasize that you've got chemical and microbiological and physical contamination as well as contamination from organic particles. And this can happen in any phase of the production or handling process for food. I'm going to conclude there because I know that due to time restraints, I cannot get too much further. We've heard about microorganisms. We know they can cause infections and toxins and uh, poisoning. And another thing I want to mention, what do microorganisms need to live? They need nutrients, they need water, they need time, they need temperature. So we have to control all of these factors to prevent contamination and the spread and therefore contamination via microorganisms. I'm going to jump a few more slides. These are the main pathogens that we're seeing producing foodborne illness, salmonella, which we've seen, campylobacter, staphylococcus, uh, Chronobacter, E. coli, or Escherichia coli, Listeria, Vibrio, among many others. We're also seeing parasites such as Toxoplasma gondii and amoebas. They can produce foodborne illnesses. We're seeing some other virus like norovirus, hepatitis E, hepatitis A, and rotavirus which can contaminate food as well. A couple of toxins, acrotoxin and aflatoxins, they can lead to foodborne illness and we need to track them. I'm not going to go too far into detail because of time restraints. The main heavy metals that can also contaminate foods are on the screen. And Jose, give me one more minute, please, just to describe this slide. Yeah, go ahead. Some of the drivers of foodborne illness, failures in the cold chain for food that could be potentially hazardous, such as room temperature or keeping food warm for several hours before it's being consumed, uh, poor handling of food with scant hygiene practices, food prepped with raw materials but not properly cleaned, environmental conditions that lead to the growth of uh, fungus or other selective pathogens, mold, inappropriate storage practices, any packaging that contains a toxic material, the use of non-drinking water, a supplementary non-controlled source of water, and poor practices on the part of the handler. And finally, we have five keys that the World Health Organization has published to prevent foodborne illness. This is how you present foodborne illness. You have to keep things clean, separate raw and cooked food, cook things completely, cook them all the way through. Key four, keep food at safe temperatures. And key five, use water and safe raw materials. So that is as far as I will take it, Jose. I know that I am running out of time. Time betrayed me today. Thank you so much. That's fine. Thank you, Danielle. We are now going to see a public sector video.
que los alimentos sean seguros es fundamental. To keep food safe is essential for people to eat correctly. We have to be able to produce safe food to prevent severe and chronic illness. That's a task that we as a society cannot ignore. Food safety is essential to upholding people's health and integrity. I'm going to talk about a couple of different types of contaminants, especially chemical contaminants and products that are used in conventional agriculture to protect crops or prevent uh, pests and uh, mold. Sometimes bad practices are used. But if we think concretely about the residue, uh, of pesticides on food, there are scientific thresholds that are the maximum permissible thresholds for the amount of pesticides that consumers can be exposed to on the food that they're eating throughout their life to prevent harmful effects to their health. Os benefícios dessas práticas são imediatos para as pessoas, para os animais, para o meio ambiente, para todo o planeta. Além disso, refletirão a longo prazo em uma manhã saudável, com impactos positivos em nível global para a saúde pública, o comércio e a economia. No dia de hoje, chamamos a atenção e buscamos disseminar ações que ajudem a prevenir, detectar e gerenciar os riscos, contribuindo para um mundo mais próspero, acessível saudável Una sola salud es que las personas cuando vayan a adquirir cualquier tipo de alimentos relacionados con nuestros productos cárnicos o sus derivados estén tranquilos. Food safety means that whenever people are going to eat meat byproducts that they can feel calm and secure that they are not going to have any harm done to their health or get any disease later on. So we want to thank the FAO and OICA, OIRSA, CCLAC, as well as the World Health Organization for making this webinar possible. We also want to offer our thanks to Peru, Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Ecuador, El Salvador, Panama, and many other countries that have been with us these two days of the seminar. Thank you so much. We're going to move now to our Q&A. The first question is for all of our panel members. Everybody can jump in. And the question is, what are the main risks of contamination that we as consumers face in our region? The microphone is open to any panel member who would like to respond. Berta, parece que abrió el micrófono, Daniel. Berta, you opened your microphone, or Daniel, would you like to go ahead? Evidently, the top challenges that we face in Latin America are also the challenges that we face worldwide. In the production phase, we're seeing major hazards when it comes to controlling chemical dangers, pesticides, and everything used out in the fields for production to protect the crops because they can be a source of potential contamination and they do entail a risk to human health. We're also seeing a risk in any other type of contaminant such as microbiological contaminants, which are a very important source of contamination, and we have to keep them in mind in the farm as well as in the packaging center and the storage center and wherever they're being sold. Because wherever you are, there's microorganisms. So what we have to do is guarantee precise, secure management of pathogens that could be potentially hazardous or potentially risky to consumer health, and they could eventually become a foodborne illness. So we are seeing some physical risks as well that could entail contamination in our region or anywhere around the world, or they may not be regions unique or hazards unique to our region. They could be hazards from the entire world. Thank you so much. Does any other panelist want to jump in?
So we're going to the next question now. This is for Berta. Traceability is a challenge for food and small production centers and small scale farmers, family farmers, fruits, vegetables, spices, F, Q, and B. What can we apply for this type of smaller scale production? I think it's a challenge for all types of production, but especially small scale production. I think best practices, best farming practices, best livestock practices are essential. If you're a small or medium sized company for food, when you are producing food that is not high risk, the general hygiene principles, the codex principles should serve as like a mental foundation for your sanitary control systems. That's a very basic platform to have. And if you are a small scale industry producing high risk food where there is a higher potential that the products could come into contact with contamination, then you need to implement another type of system such as a hazard, a risk analysis, a critical uh, points analysis, and that should be implemented at different phases. So the small scale industry should be getting support to improve their products. For example, you can see cheeses in Peru getting better and better. Uh, small cheese making companies are getting better at their practices. But we also need to keep in mind that even as improvements are made to products, safety is going to become an investment and not just a need. So we have to see it as what it is. Safety is an investment to get to new markets, both in Peru and abroad. Thank you so much, Berta, for that answer. We have another question for Catherine. It says, when milk boxes are printed with QR codes, is there a higher cost for the final product? And how much, what's the percentage by which that price goes up when the milk cartridge is printed like that? Tiver um nível já de digitalização, então esse custo acaba sendo menor. É, mas acho que aqui o que vale, é, o que eu tentei apresentar também hoje com esse, esse caso é desmistificar um pouco a ideia de que a, a, a tecnologia, a inserção do QR Code único, né, individual por embalagem, ele é uma questão de custo, né, um aumento de custo, vai representar um aumento de custo no produto final. É, ficou claro nesse, com esse projeto aqui no Brasil que a empresa ela foi, na verdade, beneficiada, ela conseguiu vender mais produtos. Então, o consumidor reconheceu o benefício de ter uma tecnologia é, embarcada naquele produto. Né? Então, a empresa passou a vender mais produtos depois com a, a inclusão da tecnologia. E se a gente for pensar o leite, que é um produto... Um, com, com, com um valor agregado, é, né, a, a disputa muitas vezes, né, aqui no Brasil as empresas disputam nos centavos é, de reais, então, a, e esse caso, né, demonstrando a utilização da tecnologia, fica evidente que é sim possível a utilização, mesmo né, em setores como a, a cadeia de, de leites, e que traz resultados bastante interessantes para a empresa. Muchas gracias, Catherine, por la respuesta. Continuamos esta consulta. Es Thank para... you for that answer. We now have a question for Ángel. And the question is, what are the biggest challenges in implementing traceability in the meat chain? One of the biggest challenges that we are facing in the meat chain is compliance and enforceability in the traceability system from the time of animal birth, especially in the primary sector, because it requires work with the livestock and for the livestock producers to comply with these standards. 
it's a matter of raising awareness among livestock producers and fortunately as a country we've already gotten past that stage but it was one of the most challenging aspects for the government and for our industry after that i think the next most challenging thing would be to create programs and create software that makes it possible to feed our database in order to enforce traceable information. And fortunately, we've done all of that. That was part of a process that we've already completed. And right now we've got everything under control in our country. Thank you, Angel. And the last question for Daniel, food during preparation. This may be a uh, means for the transmission of uh, COVID-19 since the, the, that uh, handlers may be asymptomatic uh, vectors. Looking at the behavior of the virus and knowing really that the virus will die easily, no, I, it's not really a risk. Uh, it's not really a risk. I mean, no, the problem is the following. The problem is that the ha food handler, if it's contaminated with the COVID, when preparing the food, when serving the food, the contact of, uh, of the handler with the food will transfer the virus into the food and that might might uh, might be that the virus will remain uh, alive if if, if 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 the temperature was not that high or if it was not that low the the the, the, the virus virus may remain in the food and probably there might be a vector let's say a risk for citizens however scientific studies have proven that really there is uh, no risk for consumers. Great, Daniel. Thank you. And before closing, we will go take uh, Rommel Betancourt. He is the chairperson of CC LAC uh, on a closing remarks of this uh, meeting. Uh, Rommel. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Let me thank every one of you for participating in this uh, two-day journey through food uh, safety in our region, Latin America and the Caribbean. Let me remind you briefly that uh, we did this uh, together. We're, look at this, 700 people from countries such as Argentina, Honduras, Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, Panama, Bolivia, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Venezuela, Brazil, Paraguay, where we talked uh, primary production, then into con food contaminants uh, uh, on uh, to traceability systems uh, and the handling of uh, food and, uh, and FBDs with great uh, speakers from El Salvador, Paraguay, Chile, Mexico, Nicaragua, Brazil, Peru, Trinidad and Tobago, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, and always uh, with uh, our organize, sponsoring organizations uh, such as um, FAO, United Nations FAO, the Pan American uh, 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 Panaftosa Pajo, the OIRS, uh, um, the IICA, and from Ecuador, the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Agrocalidad, the uh, Fido and So Sanitary Control Agency. It's really good to convey the message uh, receiving. Uh, video clips from different producers from the region that share with us, uh, share with us their experience. And we saw this uh, food safety situation 
in uh, in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, how we are making process, how we are uh, facing those challenges. Uh, we're we're here, uh, we're here to enhance uh, these uh, worlds. Thank you, thank you, all of you, Jose, for your wonderful uh, uh, moderation uh, of these uh, two days of webinar and. Uh, Congratulations. Uh, we'll see you soon. Uh, uh, let's take care of ourselves and, and uh, food safety. Uh, that's, that's number one. Good afternoon. Thank you, Rommel. And before we say goodbye, let me share with you a video on consumers. So see you next time and have a good afternoon or a good day, everyone. See you next time. Thank you. cariñoso saludo para todos desde El Salvador. Mi nombre es Flor de Mendoza y les envío un cordial saludo en el Día Mundial de la Inocuidad. La inocuidad alimentaria es vital. La verdad es que esto es un tema que lo hemos venido conociendo desde hace relativamente poco tiempo nosotros los consumidores. Ahora tenemos alimentos inocuos, safe food. Healthy food, healthy, uh, that will not do harm, but also uh, with the high nutritional uh, power, balance of food, that will allow us to have an active uh, life. So safety, it's critical. It's, uh, it's unthinkable now that, that, that we, we also have to find healthy diets. And safety, food safety for us as consumers is important from the two points of view. We have to find Uh, clean food, uh, food that will uh, cause no harm or disease, but uh, that are nutritionally rich and, and, and healthy. So it is important for me to find this balance, uh, tasty uh, food. Uh, my family will enjoy that with the adequate flavor, but also uh, beneficial for their health. So what I'm trying to do is to find this uh, food. In the case of uh, processed food, find these products uh, with the nutritional uh, labeling in order to compare the nutritional quality of uh, the different uh, items. I want to find Uh, or, or use products which are fresh, less processing, chemicals, less chemical, and of course, this is a uh, uh, this is this, this is very important for the food uh, industry. Consumers now are more and more demanding today. Estamos fuera, chicos. Muchas gracias. Que estén bien. Listo, gracias, hasta luego. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Gracias.